6, if you'd find that, and 1 Chronicles 15, 2 Chronicles, 2 Samuel, that's the one that's right, all right, 2 Samuel 6, 1 Chronicles 15, um, we have been talking about making decisions, making decisions, and um, as most of us know, um, if anything's gone wrong in your life, it was a decision. Uh, it might be a decision someone else made, but we make decisions, and th those decisions are, are from young people all the way up to uh, folks that are way into retirement years. We make decisions, selling a car, buying a house, changing your uh, I, I know, I know a good man, good godly man. Money got money got tight, and he canceled his. He quit making payments on his life insurance, um, just for a little while, till money got going, and uh, he had an accident and died. You know, and at this point, the the wife, she just had to believe this was what God's plan was. But those are decisions, and and you, and you know, you could prepare for everything. And God is still going to test you. So just so you know, you can't be so prepared and so together that God doesn't put something in your world. Uh, when I was in college, I, God didn't have to do any great testing in my life because I was such an idiot. I caused my own trials. God just said, leave him alone. He'll make a mess of life and cry out to me regularly. But I had a friend who was so together, Christian home, Christian school, money in order, knew how to study, all that stuff. And uh, he got meningitis. <laughs> anyway, I forget. Maybe I think it might have been. Anyway, he got something. Put him in the infirmary for months. Lost credit for the whole semester. And I thought, see, doesn't pay to study and prepare. Uh, but um, we're going to be tried. I, I don't know a, a young man who went through Bible college or through life any more orderly than Kevin Cowling. Uh, ran his own drywall business by the time he got out of high school. Going through Bible college, he was paying, I don't know, 20 young people's way to the Christian school with the profits from his business. And just a, just a great guy. And, uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't mess up in his youth. And he didn't make, he didn't grow up in a, a home without God and all. Um, but just uh, weeks before his wedding, uh, he nodded off at the wheel and got in a car accident and broke his neck. And uh, got married with the halo on his head in this. And uh, of that's bad enough. Now, I would have just postponed the wedding, but not a cowling. They have character. We planned it. We do it. Another thing he did that I wouldn't have done, he brought his brother on the honeymoon to carry the suitcases. <laughs> I'm just afraid Kevin Cowling's got more character than I do. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be tested. And don't fall apart when you're tested because we're going to be tested. That is the Christian life. God is wanting us to need him. God is knocking the rough spots off the edges. God is teaching us patience and character and compassion. There's all these things that are going on. God's not dead. And uh, your circumstances are certainly within the presence and the knowledge of God. But we've been talking about making decisions. We started out with uh, just a handful of things at the very beginning, and I'll just review because it's good to not forget the things that we have. And so we started out, number one, don't violate biblical principles. You're making a decision. If the Bible says this, don't do that. Just simple as that. Just simple, simple things. Know your Bible well enough to, to know what it says about that given area. And then we talked about don't trust your own opinion. And... Um, our feelings and our, our to trust your own opinion first and we'll get to feelings later um, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool proverbs 28 says then get good counsel but make sure your counselors are older and wiser more experienced just because you're getting advice you'll see tonight a great 47,000 people died in the story tonight because he listened to the wrong counsel he did get counsel it was wrong counsel um, make sure your counselors are wiser and more experienced. Number four, don't make decisions when you're emotional. Uh, there are huge, huge tragedies in our world because we respond emotionally. Uh, my boss makes me mad, so I throw my hands in the air and storm out and quit my job. Look, let me just give you a word of advice. Don't quit your job until you have a new job. 
Amen, ladies? Husband says, my, my boss made me so mad I quit. Go tell him you're sorry. <laughs> we make emotional decisions. Um, you know, you, you get married to somebody because your dad made you mad. Oh, my dad, I'll show him. I'm going to go marry this boy. Probably not the reason you should marry somebody. Emotions. You punch somebody because you're emotional. Don't make decisions on the basis of emotion. Now, I'm not saying don't have emotions. We all have emotions, some more than others. But you take your emotions and you put them over here. Then you take your decisions and you put them over here. And you make your decisions on the basis of biblical things, Bible principles, counsel, logic, experience. Uh, and, and if you feel sick, happy, sad, whatever, go ahead and have those feelings. And they're not bad. God gave us emotions. God has emotions. But don't let your emotions make your decisions. Um, and then we talked about part of, part of this with emotions is don't make your decisions based on guilt. <clears throat> this happens so often. You know, I was a lousy dad and I worked too many hours, never around, and my kids got these troubles, so I just buy him the beer he wants. You're violating biblical principles, okay? And uh, your being a bad father does not excuse you being a bad father still. That I was a bad father does not justify me being a stupid father. And, and there you go, just to be honest, ladies, you do a little bit more of that than the men do. The AA calls them enablers. And, uh, well, you know, I just feel bad, so I buy him his whatever. No, don't do that. Just don't be an enabler. Um, don't let guilt motivate you. Let right motivate you. And so um, our decisions are just huge. Now, tonight... Um, I want to make some simple observations about making decisions when you've made the wrong decision. So let's do a real quick survey. How many of you think you've made wrong decisions? Don't look at your spouse while you raise your hand, okay? All right. Uh, how about this? How many of you have made a decision that you knew good and well? It was a sinful decision. Nobody's going to raise their hand. God still sees it. He knew it already. Um, sure, we've sinned. You've made decisions. You were going into a situation and you, you knew, some of you, maybe two of you, um, you knew it was the wrong decision and you did it anyway. Anybody like that? I'm not asking what it is. All right. You just flat did it because you wanted to. And, and then, you know, the, the devil talks you into making that decision. And then as soon as you do it, the devil says, you are so bad. Before you do it, the devil says, everybody does it. It's not that big a deal. Afterwards, he says, you're so bad, God wouldn't forgive you. Uh, don't, uh, don't do that. Now, so tonight, I want to talk to you about making decisions after you've made bad decisions. Because... In my estimation, I'm not the statistician, but I believe the majority of the big disasters are a product of our reaction to wrong, not the wrong. If I were to take the, the biggest hurt I can think of, of among people that I know in the last decades, it was not the the wrong, the wrong was wrong, but it was the reaction to the wrong that hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt. And so we need to understand you're going to do wrong. You have done wrong. I'm not justifying it. I'm not making any excuses. We do wrong because we're bad. 1 Corinthians 10 says there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Number one, you're not the only one. It's common to man, but God is faithful. It's not based on you. It's based on God's faithfulness. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able? You are able. I am able. But will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it? I face temptation. I can say no. I can escape. I can bear that temptation. I can, I can, I can. And when I don't, 
It's not because I'm weak, because he is strong. It's because I choose to not trust him, and I choose to do what I want to do, and I sin because I'm a sinner. Amen. All right, we'll just get that all settled. I know at least three of you are honest tonight. So, but what are we going to do? The issue is not that you sin. The issue is what now? And that's what I want us to take some time to look at. All right, so first of all, um, look, look here at uh, first, uh, whatever book you're in. I don't even care. <laughs> Second Samuel 6, all right? Familiar story. And um, we're going to look at a couple verses here. Second Samuel 6, again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David arose, and with all the people that were with him uh, in Baal of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubim. And they, I'm in verse 3 of 2 Samuel 6. And they set the ark of God upon a what? A new cart. They didn't put it on some old rattle trap cart. They put it on a new cart. What is the proper biblical way to move the ark? Carry it. Very clearly, very deliberately, we won't go back to the, the uh, Exodus to talk about it, but when they built that ark, they had special wooden poles covered with gold, and the priests carried it. Four priests carried it on their ark, not the ark, Noah's ark. Someone asked, how did they carry that big boat all over the wilderness? <laughs> Didn't you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark? Come on. Um, I don't know what that is. Mr. Beal talked about it. But um, this is about four foot by six foot and the little tent thing over it. And they carried it on the sh their shoulders. And that was the way they're supposed to do it. David is, he's excited. He wants the ark of God in Jerusalem where it belongs. And they put it on the ark. <coughs> Verse 4. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is in Gibeah, um, Accompanying the ark of God and Ohio uh, went before the ark and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord and all manner of instruments. Boy, they're excited. They're playing instruments. They're dancing around. They're jumping up and down excited. Verse 6, and when they came to Nachshon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, took a hold of it for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord made a breach upon Uzzah and called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said the next question, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Do you think David knew? We'll see in a minute. David did right in a wrong way. But doing right in a wrong way is still wrong. And he did wrong. I remember, remember many, many years ago, these kids are all married now, but Mrs. Goddard was telling about kindergarten. She was our kindergarten teacher before Mrs. Beal. And she said, uh, she told all the kids, you know, find the elephant or find the letter T or whatever it is. She said, take your finger. Everybody hold your finger up. And I want you to put your finger on the number two or whatever and this one kid did this put his thumb on it she corrected that now they call him Frodo the four fingers <laughs> and you might say what's the big deal it's how he did it and we have child rearing philosophy's wrong and we need to understand not just what we do but how we do it matters and uh, they're your children and uh, you do as God leads you to do with your children but I want to encourage you uh, teach them teach them teach them teach them so David wasn't malicious but he still didn't do it right and a guy died a, hus a wife lost her husband kids lost their dad and so he takes the ark, puts it over at the guy's house there, and God just blesses and blesses the house. And you can read the story later on. And David heard how he's blessing. He said, we got to get that thing into Jerusalem because I want the blessing of God. 
Now, take your Bible, look over to 1 Chronicles. Chronicles and Samuel retell a lot of the same stories, but they do tell it from different angles. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Um, if you're reading one and you're going to preach on it, many of you guys preach in rest homes and Sunday schools and all, if you're preaching out of Samuel, Kings, or Chronicles, always read the, the, uh, the cross-reference passage because in 1 Samuel, you'll hear this, and in 1 Chronicles, it comes from a different angle, and it's different. Uh, sometimes it's different, like um, Luke is the doctor apostle, and he records Jesus and the cross, blood and water flowing out of his side when the spear pierced his side. Evidence, the heart had burst or ruptured, and the water was proof of the death, and the waters were all gather, gathering together in his abdomen. But Matthew didn't. Matthew's a tax collector. What's he know about medical things? Mark, what is, what is Mark? You know, I don't even know what Mark was. Um, I don't know. We'll call him a fisherman. Um, Mark didn't record it. John didn't record it. Luke recorded it. And so you're going to get different situations. I'll explain one here in a, in a minute when we get to this next text. But look at 1 Chronicles chapter 15. And David made him a house, made him houses in the city of David, that's Jerusalem, and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. Now David's not only saying we're going to carry it, but we're having the right guys carry it. Sometimes that hurt that entered your life, it's so you are more careful to do right next time. You don't like the hurt, you don't like the loss, but if God polishes you, if God corrects you in love, it's for a reason. And, and David was corrected, and a man lost his life. And David, verse 3, gathered all Israel together, and he got all these people together. And then if you look down at verse 13, he names the priests that are going to do this. In verse 13, for because you did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us for that we sought him not after due order. There is a proper way to do things. Do it that way. Don't get things out of order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And so now let's just look at the story. All right, number one, David sinned. And there was a tragic end of that sin. A good man lost his life. So we're not talking about you not sinning. We're talking about you're going to sin. Now, what are you going to do? First of all, David was a little mad. How are we going to do it then? Hey, I'm trying to do the right thing here. No, you're not. But see, that's the emotions. That's the emotions here. And David, uh, he's emotional. He's afraid of God. He's, he's shook up about this thing. He named the place after Uzzah, Perez Uzzah, a breach upon Uzzah. And, uh, you know, he, he, he names the place and, and, you know, trying to make a monument. Little, there's still a steel monument there or something. I don't know what. He took the ark, put it in the guy's house, left it over there. But what was smart is he didn't do anything. Because right now, he's hurting. Right now, he'd made a very wrong choice. Right now, the price tag was high. And so David sinned, and he, he just put a stop on everything. So I'll go back to Jerusalem. Leave the ark there. He goes back to Jerusalem. He gets right with God. He gets this thing settled. And he says, now, let's do it again the right way. And so the proper response when we sin is not to deny that you sin. We'll see that in just a minute. But the proper response is, if it's, especially if it's emotional, is to stop, step away from it. Don't let your emotions get you to make a decision because right now is when people quit church. If that's how you're going to be, God, I am done with you. Oh, you really break God's heart. It's like heaven will never be the same. You walk out on God, you are the one that got hurt. 
maybe your family, maybe your friend, maybe somebody you're going to teach in Sunday school, but you're the one. I'm the one. Now, I know people who've been hurt and they've walked out on God and walked out on church. You know, they joined Fundamentalist Anonymous. And they went to some rock and roll church somewhere and did nothing the rest of their Christian life, never witnessed again. All they're going to do is get to heaven flat busted. They didn't hurt God. God already hurt for them on Calvary. But David, he didn't get mad at God. Maybe a little, I don't know. But he didn't quit on God. So he came back and he said, now. Let's do it the right way. So number one, when you sin, the number one thing is don't respond emotionally and don't do anything. Don't make any major decisions. Um, you, 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 help, you had somebody help finance you. you I had, had somebody, I'm thinking so many stories I can't tell. <laughs> Let me make up a story. Perhaps there was a person one day <laughs> so many good stories something went wrong and you, you just sinned you did wrong and uh, you want to run and hide I don't how could I ever go back to church again um, get in the car drive down get out walk in the back door feel ashamed sit down listen to the preaching that would be the hardest walk you made but do it anyway you don't think it was hard for David to go back to Jerusalem knowing his decision killed this man? Then he goes back to move the ark again. Hey, let's all go move the ark. The excitement is gone. <laughs> rah, rah, rah. And they're all saying, no way, man. Can I have the day off, boss? We're not going to quit. We're not going to walk out. right thing we're going to do it right this time all right um we're going to look over to first chronicles 19 but uh when you find that find proverbs 28 before we use we'll, we'll be first chronicles 19 but look at proverbs 28 and most of you could probably quote this but we'll look at it just for a moment proverbs 28 what do we do when we sin See, this is decision-making after you've done wrong. I went down to the Circle K, and I robbed the Circle K. Well, as long as I didn't take $900 worth of stuff, they can't get me. Because I'm in California where stupid reigns. Um, it's ridiculous. But I, I might have, by the way, you might have some earthly results of your decision. But here's the thing. When you sin, to me, the thing that's so vital You've sinned. You know what you want next? You know what you want more than anything next? God's presence. That's what you want. Because when I sin, I put a wall between me and God. You know what I want? I want that wall down. I want God close to me. You say, can you be close to God when you sin? If you can't, none of us are. And we'll look at how you get there right here in Proverbs 28. Uh, I, want God, I want God near to me. Look at Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. That is a statement of fact. And the first thing Adam did, he wanted to blame his wife. Makes sense if you don't want God's blessing. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh, what's that next word? Them. You know, God knows you're a sinner. When you sin, God didn't pull his hair out and say, I can't believe it. I never dreamed you'd sin. He knew already you were going to sin. You might say, how could God love me? Um, he loved you yesterday. He loved you last year. And last year he knew what you'd do next year. God doesn't love you because you don't sin. God loves you because God is awesome. Now you want to be close to God. You've got to deal with your sin. So he says, whoso confesseth, that's one thing you'll see again in the scriptures in a minute. You confess it and you forsake them. I'm done with those things. I'm done with that. It's out of my life. And then the devil comes along and says, oh, you're going to do it again. You just fight that thing. But right now, what are we going to do? We're, we're talking about how do you secure the presence of God? How do you act after you've done wrong? Now, I'm not, again, none of this, I'm not saying you... 
you walk out on your job mad, you're cussing and yelling and fighting with people at work, and you walk out, I quit this stupid job, um, you can be thoroughly right with God that day, unemployed. I'm not saying everybody around you says, you know, so the guy got mad and he did donuts in his little sports car in my front yard and tore up my roses and my grass. Um, he might be able to get right with God, but he's not right with me. So we do have a world around us. What you, but what you want, even if the world's mad at you, you know what you want? You want God's blessing. That's what you want. More than money, more than security, more than good health, you want God. All right, so look over there. We're back in Chronicles now, First Chronicles 19. First Chronicles chapter 19. Now this is a story of the guy who got bad counsel and he did something really stupid. I don't know if it was sinful. Close. Now it came to pass after this that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, that's a neighbor, all right? That'd be like San Diego and Wildemar if they were separate countries. Um, Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, died and his son reigned in his stead. One of these things that we'll talk about along the way, Lord willing, is don't make decisions when you're brand new, do your very best to limit decisions because you don't know what's going on. Um, you, anyway, the whole, that's, that's another subject. Verse 2, and David said, I'll show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. And David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. So the servants of David came to the land of the children of Ammon to Hanan to comfort him. David's motives were good. Hanan was hurting his father had died. He's now in a new position, trying to figure out how to run this place. He didn't know what he's doing. Verse 3, the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, and that he sent comforters to thee? Are not his servants come to thee for to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? Now, that was bad advice. When you first become a boss, a manager of position of leadership in the ministry you got to be so careful because there's going to be people there wanting to give you advice remember when Rehoboam took the throne from Solomon he had the old men's advice and the young men's advice and he made the mistake of listening to the young men so Hanan he listened to these advisors these counselors and verse four wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved them big deal for a Jew shaved those beards off and cut off their garments in the midst hard by their buttocks and sent them away. Uh, these guys were humiliated, shamed, and sent walking down the road. Verse 5, Then there went certain and told David how the men were served. And he sent to meet them, and the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they had made themselves odious to David, Hanan and the children of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire them chariots and horsemen out of Mesopotamia and out of Syria, Maica, and out of Zobah. So they hired 30 and 2,000 chariots. They hired 32,000 chariots. Can you even imagine that? And a bunch of people along with it. And they set themselves to battle. Now I want you to notice verse 6. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, verse 6. When the children of Ammon saw they had made themselves odious to David. At that moment, right now. All right, so first of all, Hanan did something really stupid. Sinful maybe, maybe not. I don't know, shaving a guy's beard, embarrassing him, cutting his clothes off too short. Isn't that interesting? They even know there's things that a man shouldn't wear too short. How about that? Anyway, discretion. Um, another subject. Something else I can offend people on. And so... Here he is, he's done wrong. Verse 6, he realizes how stupid he was. Right here. Has anybody died yet? No giant tragedies yet, right? David is really mad. Hold that spot. We'll get back to it in just a minute. If you skip down a few verses, this is a passage where Joab and Abishai, the brothers, nephews of, of David, Joab takes half the army, uh, Abishai takes half the army, they fight against the enemy, 
And we go down to uh, verse, uh, six, uh, verse 18. But the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in the chariots, and 40,000 footmen, and killed Shopak, the captain of the host. 47,000 people died. That's a lot of death. Notice verse 19. And when the servants of Hadrezer saw that they were put to the worst before David, they made peace with David and became his servants. Neither would the Syrians help the children of Ammon any more. Now, here's the, here's the wrong decision. You made a foolish decision, a sinful decision, an idiotic decision, a pride decision, an arrogant decision, whatever it might be. You made a decision. Now, your choice is buff up and stand in your wrong decision. Hire soldiers and hire chariots. Or your decision could be, what, what, what did we read there at that last verse? Look at verse 18, or verse 19. They made peace with David. What if you took verse 19 and you put it in place of verse 6? All right, verse 5, David found out about it. Verse 6, they realized they made themselves odious to David. That means they made him stink, corrupt. And verse 19, they made peace. 47,000 people would not have died. I'm not, I'm not going to hedge on preaching holiness or obedience to God or righteous living. But I see more people hurt with the way we respond to sin, especially our own sin. We get proud. We defend ourselves. We justify ourselves. Well, she did it to me, so why can't I do it back to her? Uh, I've, I've had men do wrong in, in their marriage, and I've had... Wives, sit in my office and tell me, I want him to hurt like I hurt. Well, there's Jesus all over you, girl. I don't say that. She's got real feelings. She's got a broken heart. But in this case, had they made peace with David, had Hanan said, I am going to feed you guys to the lions. And he'd gone to David and said, I listened to the wrong people. I misunderstood. I am so sorry. Nobody died yet. The people died because he doubled down on his uh, conviction that he did the right thing. And I got a right to do this. And I can do this. It's my privilege to do this. And I can retaliate. All those people died. Because he misresponded, he ill-responded to his own bad decision. Tragedy beyond words. Look, look over just a page or two, chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 1, Satan stood up against Israel. And if you want to write next to that, first, uh, first Chronicles 21, write 2 Samuel 24. That's where you'll find the counterpart. And the story's a little different. You want to read them both. Before you teach this story, you want to read both of those. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba, that's the south, even to Dan, that's way north. Bring me the number of them that I may know it. And Joab answered, uh, the Lord make his people a hundred times uh, so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? Uh, why will he be a cause of trespass in Israel? We don't understand all the details, but we know this. It was wrong. And Joab, as a general, said, this is going to be, this is a trespass. This is a sin. You can't do this. But David, the king, insisted on it. And so he went ahead and did it. Part of it was kind of half-hearted if you read the whole story. And he comes back with the number of people. David did wrong. You're going to do wrong. You want to go lock the doors and windows and hide and never see a human being again? Go ahead. Make your life worthless. Be of no value to anybody, including Jesus. But God always invites us back. Always. He always wants you back. 
And so David did wrong, simple as that. And so you go down to verse uh, 7, and God was displeased with the thing. Therefore he smote Israel, and David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. Remember we read over there in Proverbs 28? He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh it shall have mercy. What do you need when you've sinned? Mercy. What do you need when you've done wrong? You want God's presence. And you can have the presence of God when you've done wrong if you respond properly to the wrong you've done. I talked with the teenagers about this today, but when, our, when uh, Brother Josh was little, we, we had a general rule in our house. You don't throw balls in the house. There's too many things that'll break. And I had, we had no money. I mean, we were so broke. And I bought these matching lamps at Kmart. They were so expensive. They were like $19 a lamp. But it was a lot of money in those days. And they were a light in the bottom and a light in the top and a glass globe. And they were just classy things. And he and I were horsing around. My wife wasn't home. And one of us, probably me, threw the ball and broke one of those. Now, here's the thing. The rule is don't throw balls. Teenagers can't answer. They did this at chapel today. The rule is don't throw the ball. So is it worse to throw the ball? Is it more of, an, of, a, of a sin to throw the ball and not break the lamp or throw the ball and break the lamp? It's the same. Because the, the rule is not don't break the lamp. The rule is don't throw the ball. And therein is parental mistake number two tonight. We punish the child because they inconvenience us. We punish the child because they embarrass us. Do you know what people will think of me? My children never heard me say that, not one time. Nothing to do with what people think. They broke a rule. They offended God. They violated the scriptures. They made God angry. What does God say we need to do? It's not about how you look. We're not supposed to be men pleasers. That's condemned in Ephesians and Colossians. And so he and I went to Kmart and bought another lamp before my wife got home. <laughs> and she's homesick tonight. She still doesn't know what happened <laughs> unless she's watching. I'm sorry. I confess and repent. <laughs> I think we told her. But the wrong is breaking the rule. Can we get that thing all messed up? All right. So David broke the rule. He says, I've sinned. And so the summary of the story, we don't have time to go through the whole story. You can read it. But he says, you can have this happen to you, or this happen to you, or this happen to you. And Gad, the, the preacher, he comes along and he says to David, what do you want? You can have this, this, or this. And David says, let me fall into the hands of God. Let, let God judge us because God's merciful. And you read over there at the end of the story, um, uh, verse 15, and God sent an angel into Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, it is enough. Well, that's great, except verse 14, the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel, and there fell in Israel 70,000 men. 70,000 people died. But what David did right is he acknowledged it, he repented of it, and then he fell before God for mercy. Look over to 1 John, and we'll close. Wait, almost to the end of your Bible, right before the book of Revelation, there's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Not the Gospel of John, but the, the little tiny books. Most of you know these verses, but we're just going to put them here because we've got to get these ideas. Again, what, tonight is not decision-making so that you don't sin. Or decision-making, you know, you, you buy a Chrysler. God will forgive you. Um, you know, we're not talking about, tonight's not about, a, you know, your decision, an emotional decision. Your spouse dies and you walk around the house, you see them everywhere, so you just sell the house. You give it away. Uh, your marriage is splitting up, so you just run off and ignore everything. You know, I, I've, got a, I've got a problem with a man that runs off on his wife and children. You still have a financial responsibility. I've got a real issue, and I know some preachers who've done it. And I think, you, you are so not right with God. 
Don't even pretend you're right with God while your wife's trying to figure out a way to feed the children. And you're out getting better. Uh, get life insurance and drive off a bridge. I'm not recommending that. I'm not counseling that. People on the internet. If you sit on the internet being a critic, I can hardly wait to be at the judgment seat, man. <laughs> no, not really. Not really. Don't rejoice when your enemy stumbles or God will lighten the hand off of them. All these, bi see, every decision you make has got a Bible verse that goes with it. <laughs> but you've done wrong. You're going to do wrong. Don't point a finger at anybody. Don't blame your wife, don't blame your husband, don't blame your parents, don't blame the government, don't blame, you know, 400 years ago, you know, somebody threw a rock through my dog's doghouse window. Just don't do that. Just admit it. I did wrong. See, I'll be embarrassed. You'd be better off admitting it yourself than letting God reveal it. Because God will do that stuff. All right? You confess it. You forsake it. Look at 1 John 1, 8, chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You're not the only one. We've all sinned. We're sinners. That's what we are. How could I ever go back to church? All those good people. <laughs> no offense, but I know who's in the room. <laughs> I'll never forget. Uh, I can't use names, but a guy who, he was rough. And he'd gotten in all kinds of trouble. He'd been lots of trouble on the way. But he got saved and got right. And he was, he was serving in our church. And another guy came along. And, and I was trying to win this guy to Christ. And, and he was a good guy. But he had some issues. And um, mainly booze. And he, one day I was talking to him. He said, Pastor, I'd get saved if I could be as good a man as that. And he named this guy. And I thought, if only I could tell you the, <laughs> all the things about. I couldn't. You know, I never did. Um, but the devil will tell you you're not good enough to go to church. The devil will tell you you've made too many dumb decisions or you're not a good enough Christian. Oh, stop it. Church is for sinners. For Christians to get saved, for the lost to get saved, the Christians to grow in grace and, and, and find victory. And so don't, don't act like we've not sinned. Verse 9, if we confess our sin, this is in Proverbs 28, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've mentioned this before, but number one, when you go to God confessing your sin, or when he forgives you, and then he cleanses you. Two different things. You've done something in your marriage that hurt your spouse and um, spent a bunch of money wrongly or whatever it might be. You know, you foolish with your finances. You lost a business. You lost a house. And your spouse forgives you. And, uh, yeah, you're forgiven, but they remind you, you know, we would have had a house had your dad not blah, blah, blah. Now, people will do that, but God won't. God won't do that. God not only forgives, he cleanses. It's all gone. You got a great God. What a God. What a God. Chapter 2. My little children, these things write I do that you sin not. Stop your sinning. Is that pretty clear? Stop it. But look at the next, the next word. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Number one, be good. Number two, isn't it great we got Jesus to cover for us? Now, the, the whole lesson here, when you sin or when you've just made a foolish decision, the girl who married against her father's wishes, I think of two right now, told me in my office, their dads and their pastors were against them, not from our church, but people I know very well, um, married against the, their good counsel and, and a horrible big mess they ended up in. And when their marriage, and they ended up in our church along the way, and um, when the marriage broke up, they got out of church embarrassed they were whatever and I, I think that's not the right way to respond you go to God say God I didn't listen to my dad didn't listen to my pastor I married wrong and now my marriage is falling apart I want to be right with you God says okay 
How hard is that? That's what God does. Now, people on earth might not, but God does. And what you need in your tomorrow is God, because God will take care of the people. And so I don't have to worry about about things that happen to me or even the dumb things I do. What I need to be focused on is the presence of God. You can have God's blessing. But let's just make sure we don't do something next to miss the blessing. Both those gals, by the way, at one point or another, were living in, the, in their car with their children. They, they could have stayed in church. It would have been a little humbling, but you see, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. That's what God does. But, but the proud, God will abase. We better close. Father, help us uh, to learn more about you, to learn more about how you want us to live. And may we, when we sin, when we make prideful decisions, foolish decisions, may we cling to you and make good decisions that we would please you and have your presence in our future. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night. Soul winning tomorrow night and Saturday morning. Join us.